I, uh, I would like to thank the organizers. Uh, they have invited me without understanding what I will talk about. I think it's very dangerous uh, and uh, it's courageous. Uh, my name is Ogaz Nalman, as you heard, and I am uh, I'm a cat among the herbalists here because I am a particle physicist from KTH, Royal Institute of Technology. I, uh, I uh, am retired since a number of years, so I'm free. If that exists as a concept in your mind, you know, maybe freedom is not uh, part of, of our exist existential situation. But I would like to speak about some, some uh, topics that have come up as I have been listening to the philosophical discussion concerning whether we have free will or, or if consciousness can come out from the materialistic point of view in science as an emergent property. Because when I hear these things, I wonder what I have been doing all my life. I mean, because science <coughs> has changed a lot in the perception of how we look upon nature in the last hundred years, and I would like to highlight some of these things. Uh, in modern physics, there is no longer anything like a detached observer. If there ever was, it is no longer there. When we interact with nature, we disturb nature in some way, and it is uh, not any longer possible to keep this idea of being detached. And this means that the role of the observer modern physics have come to the foreground and the observer must, in my opinion, be conscious during the act of observation, otherwise I don't know what an act of observation is, but um, if you have objections to that, uh, which is possible, then we can discuss this. But the, another point is that models have a, a central place in the interpretation of observations. We have to understand, and we do of course, that we learn to see. And uh, as I have seen many times, you know, when students come uh, to the, the institute, uh, they are young, they don't have children, so they think that they uh, understand everything about what it means to perceive reality. But when you have children that grow up, you understand that this process is a long and difficult process. And uh, we have to learn to see things. Uh, so that's that's a part of the education for a PhD degree that we have these four years first for the masters and then we have four years for the PhD because we, we, have, we would like to see in the same way otherwise we cannot have consensus about things when we speak about it. So it takes some time and that is true even in theory. You have to look upon the problem and, the, and the structure it in a certain way in order to be able to handle it with the mathematics and the techniques you are, and so you have to learn to see the problems in this way as a theoretician sees that. So this is another way of learning. <laughs> but we know that we have to learn how to see in microscopes, we have to learn how to see in, in astronomical tubes, and we have to learn how to see it on the radiographic plates in the show board, in the medical unit when you, when you, teach, you learn how to become a doctor. <laughs> but but uh, this uh, this uh, understanding of how we look upon nature has also come into focus when the Renaissance came and, and introduced the idea of causality as a fundamental principle of how to look upon the world. I have a funny uh, memory of my daughter when she was three years old, when she started to learn about causality, because in the beginning it didn't come, because she couldn't separate causality from correlations. So she said, Dad, I went to the pot and, uh, and did PP, and my PP knew that it was evening now. Why? I said, yes, because when I sat down, the PP came, and it is evening now. So that was her interpretation. And, well, <laughs> later she learned much better and said, she took a course in chemistry in, in the Royal Institute of Technology. So she has a different perception of uh, the re relation between correlation and uh, and the causality at the present time. But sometimes I have the impression that my friends are not so sure about whether the correlation is in fact causality or it's not. But that is another problem. So scientists then are free to design the experiments and create models. If that is not the case, I don't know what we have been doing all the time. So as I mentioned, you know, <coughs> This has become very central, and the, the, 
point is that uh, metaphysical principles are also actually models. This, I think, came to a, a big shock in the last century. Because we had been uh, used to, for several hundred years, of Newtonian metaphysical ideas concerning absolute time, absolute space, matter, and uh, of course causality, and his three laws of mechanics that were so enormously useful and gave so many results that when Einstein came and said that maybe we should change the principle that is a metaphysical structure of how we are, we are perceiving nature and modify them to find a better way, which I used to call the framework. So these metaphysical principles constitute the framework and inside this framework we can then propose models for various systems and then we can solve these models and then they make sense. They make all the sense inside the framework. But <clears throat> once he found out that there might not be any absolute space and absolute time and so on, then he modified this, this basic structure of Newtonian physics into uh, this general theory of relativity. And it took a long time for people to uh, digest this change in perception. And it's still like, and it's very difficult for us to come out of the Newtonian box, because even when I read uh, papers concerning black holes that say the forces close to back, black holes are so enormous that even light cannot come out. There are no forces at all in Einstein's general theory of relativity. There's only curved space, <coughs> time, space time. So the language doesn't really catch up with the new perception. In quantum physics also, Niels Bohr emphasized the importance of the free will to decide what kind of experiment you will do when you interact with microsystems on the quantum level. So that came out in, in, in the, the codification of the complementarity principle of Copenhagen School. So he said that either you decide to figure out what the localized sensation properties are of a quantum system, and then unfortunately by the circumstances of your experimental setup you cannot say nothing about the momentum content of the system. Whereas if you try to figure out the momentum properties of a system, you cannot say where it is localized. So this later, of course, is codified in Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. <laughs> I will use this free will then in the sense of that the, uh, the, the scientist has a free will to achieve some intended aim among the various possibilities there are. And for me, possibilities mean then there is a freedom of choosing between possibilities. Other words doesn't really have a meaning for me. So the fact that the language that we are using is that there are a certain set of possibilities here means that there is some freedom here to choose among these possibilities. This choice is of course not unlimited, but otherwise there wouldn't be any possibilities. If everything was determined from the beginning, there would be there wouldn't be any possibilities. So <laughs> then I, I have the free will, I, I think, to determine what perspective I will put on nature, which is even one step beyond the, the framework in the sense. Is it deterministic, indeterministic, or intentional, or what is it? So it starts there. If you say that I have no choice, then it's just difficult to understand what exactly you mean with what you are doing. I will now just give you some few examples here. Einstein said, you know, that I am free to decide what is meant by simultaneity. So simultaneous things are those things that if you have uh, some two uh, flash lamps here and you divide this into the middle and the flashes arrive simultaneously in the middle point, then they are sent out simultaneously. And this definition then led him to see that people, that uh, observers in different inertial systems, they don't see the simultaneity in the same way. For them, this what is simultaneous for me is not simultaneous for another one who is moving with respect to my coordinate system. 
And that was, a, of course, also an enormous shock because in the Newtonian theory of absolute time and space, you had a, a fixed time, universal time, that it, if you could use to define simultaneity wherever you liked. So that changed also the understanding of how we look upon nature. So it, uh, that, that I was already mentioned, you know, that he changed Newton's principle of mechanics and gravity to be uh, governed by space, time and forces. <coughs> the space, time and... Uh, and so he changed the space, time and structure, uh, space, the structure of space, time and forces into curved space, time. Uh, which is curved and close to matter. Mm -hmm. So in, in, the new, in Einstein's mind, it's quite interesting to see he had two ontological positions during his lifetime. In the beginning, he said, geometry is the reality. And then, geometry gives rise to forces and the dynamics because of its, of its curvature, and so it's space-time. But later, when he tried to integrate electromagnetism with the gravity, which was not successful though, and still not successful, then he changed to said the fields are the primary objects, ontological objects, and they give rise to the geometry, the geometry that we see. <laughs> so this question is of course still open, but it is a, a, a question of uh, of creative imagination at the present time, whether that would be finally found in the, in the superstring theory or the M theory, we don't know, because none of them have been able to come up with a, with a trustworthy idea of what is at the bottom of, of nature. Niels Bohr, he and his complementarity are also already dis discussed a little. So, <coughs> This led to the idea of entanglement in quantum physics, which is also a very strange phenomenon that is difficult to understand from a classical point of view. So quantum systems that have been in contact with each other, and they can be prepared so that they are entangled with each other. And this entanglement can, is not dependent on the extension of the system at all, and its uh, progression in time if it is undisturbed. And there is an experimental demonstration over at least uh, 730 kilometers of distance that entanglement is a, is a reality in quantum phenomena. <coughs> so I would like to use this. Uh, and here you can see probably a board, because I can come back to probably in a bit while, if I have time. So Cochran and Specker <laughs> in the 1967. They showed a very important theorem, which also was a shock for, for many people who even thought they understood quantum mechanics. Namely, that a very simple system of spin 1, the square of the, uh, of the uh, angular momentum components, S, X, X, Y, and S, Z, they commute, but still there is no mapping for, for, for the system before the measurement to after the measurement. This mapping does not exist because there is no domain of values. The system does not show up any values at all that we can talk about. So that is that was also some kind of a problem because what, is, what are the elements of reality then for a quantum system if we cannot talk about them before the measurement? It does not it does not have any properties that we, we understand. Conway and Cochran later, <laughs> in 2009, showed this theorem that is called the, the, theorem, the strong theorem of free will. So this is uh, maybe a little bit too complicated for me to enter into in detail, but they say basically that the entangled quantum system as a whole retains its coherence and makes its free will decision how to show up independently of its previous history if the experimentalist has free will to decide the setting of the instruments. So, if we have free will to decide how to measure the system, then the system has free will to show it up itself. So you can go to YouTube and, and, and study uh, this, these properties if you like, but that is, seems to be a, a, a consequence of the 
fundamental uh, structure of quantum mechanics, which is an extremely well-tested theory, which has been withstood um, uh, very many tests during the last hundred, well, the 75 years or 80 years or so that we had it. It started in, in 1925, approximately. Wolfgang Pauli, who was uh, one of the Thank you. Oh, one of the um, founders of this Copenhagen school, he didn't do, uh, he, of course he did many things in, in uh, quantum physics, but not, uh, he was not uh, one of the creators of quantum mechanical formalism. But he said that there is no longer any individual causality in nature, only statistical causality, because we cannot in any way predict what happens with a single experiment, only an ensemble of experiments can be carried out. And then the theory tells you what this ensemble mean value should be and how the distribution should be. So that is what the, this is so-called wave function, when you square it, it tells you about the probability and that is shown that you do many experiments, but any single experiment is impossible to predict. So he tried to say that there is some irrationality in reality that we have to face. <laughs> and we can look then upon this Heisenberg uncertainty relation, which of course comes out from the formalism directly, that there is some kind of irreducible arrest of freedom for quantum systems. You can't squeeze them, uh, because the, in classical physics they, they can be described by a point in phase space. So phase space is the space of momenta and positions, a six-dimensional space for a point particle. And that is a point in this space tells you what the state of a particle is. It tells you the momentum and the position. But in quantum physics there is no point. There is an extended area of the order of the Planck's constant that it looks as if it is in a comprehensible fluid. So if you press it in this way, it goes out that way. If you press it in the momentum way, it goes out along the other line. So you cannot uh, reduce that, <laughs> that uh, amount of freedom that the system has. So how shall we interpret all these things in mod from modern physics? So that could be a super determinism, or is it an intentionality in nature? Or there could be some other interpretation too. I would like just to, to mention that if superdeterminists exist, then I live in a strange and absurd world. And uh, for me, this is very difficult to accept. So, if then the natural thing would be for me, then that would be to say there is some kind of in, in intentionality in nature, and that would be very much in line with the irrationality that Pauli, Pauli was talking about. He was in fact discussing this in, in the same terms. And there, are, there is a nice book by Larikainen that has tried to expose Pauli's thinking about these things in his correspondence with Marcus Fierz, which is available in the CERN library. The idea of panpsychism then comes up as a, one of the possible candidates, and I understand that I put my head in a, uh, in a not the viper's nest, but almost when I mention that. But in some sense, it doesn't contradict the mechanical aspects found in nature, because if you have strong willpower, it looks very mechanical. So if we understand the stratification of this panpsychic idea, from elementary particle all the way up to uh, the universe itself, passing through the solar system and the galaxy, we can understand maybe that these uh, conditions that we are under are, are determined by the willpower of all these higher levels in this stratification. But I think also that it shows why mind can act on matter because because that is, uh, for me, not a direct problem, because I know I use that all my, all my time, but it seems to be a philosophical problem. It's possible also to understand that there are laws of nature, because these laws of nature, <coughs> uh, they would come out naturally as tra almost traffic rules. If anyone who thinks that laws of nature are 
very tight, it should go into the laboratory and see how difficult it is to try to verify that. So the real miracle actually is that several of these laws can be written down on half a piece of paper and be applicable to millions and millions and millions of cases. So I would uh, end this just by uh, discussing that uh, the examples I would think about for uh, talking for panpsychics and with biosymbiotics, endosymbiosis, and the anthropic cosmological principle. Just let me end by Freeman Dyson, who, who, uh, who has mentioned in his book Disturbing the Universe two sentences that came to my mind as I was thought about this. The more I examine the universe and study the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe in some sense must have known that we were coming. That's actually a strong, uh, strong uh, anthropic principle. And then he says the processes of human consciousness differ only in degree but not in kind from the processes of choice between quantum states which we call chance when they are made by electrons. So this is uh, an example of a scientist that they also have thought about in, in lines of this panpsyche idea. So when we think about what nature and say that it's all about uh, materialistic thinking and that panpsychic ideas couldn't possibly be that in elementary particles, we should be careful because we first of all have understood we know only 5% of the universe energy content. The rest is completely not understood. Of these 5%, this type of materials I'm knocking in is less than 0.1. So it's less than a per mil. So why should the elementary particles not be filled with structure which we haven't decided, the, 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 been able to, to, uh, to describe yet? I, mean, I think we should be humble enough and, and realize that nature is filled with wonders and we have just not scratched on the surface. So we shouldn't be too hasty to draw conclusions from this quite primitive uh, scientific picture we have today. That's what I would like to say. Thank you.